On this edition of Thinking Biblically, we're going to be looking at how our personal life experience gets in the way of understanding the scriptures. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all of Scripture speaks to all of life. Before we get into this week's topic, I'm so excited to announce the registration is now open for my God's Epic Story Seminar that's going to be taking place in person June the 10th, 2023 at West Ottawa Community Church. This is the first time I'm doing this in person in a long time, first time I'm doing in Ottawa in a long time. The God's Epic Story Seminar enables people to see the Bible's big picture and through that, understand its details like never before. And and through this, uh, you'll have the opportunity to discover how your life fits into God's overall plan. And so again, it's at West Ottawa Community Church, June the 10th. Uh, there will be a link in the description, but it's bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y slash W-O-C-C 2023. You do need to register. The cost is free. There will be a free will offering with a suggested donation. Lunch is going to be included, and I think we're going to have a great time. So you uh, you can register there, and get more information, let other people know. Well, in this edition of Thinking Biblically, I'm getting back to um, a plan that I I had some weeks ago where uh, I wanted to elaborate on what's in this little booklet called Undermining Forces, Nine Popular Approaches Attacking the Authority of Scripture Today. Sounds ominous. It is ominous. It's my conviction that there's many ways that the way we read the Bible actually undermines its power, its authority. Um, The first one, uh, that I did some time ago was uh, the, this what does it, how we read the Bible through the lens of what does it mean to me instead of what does it mean. The second one, uh, which we're not doing, the second one is truth can't be known. And this is something that I tend to talk about, that the the Bible is, is the revelation of the reality of the way things really are. And I have done that before in my podcast. So I'm going to be addressing it again. Uh, you can look that up. So we're not going to be doing that one. Then we're going to go to the next one in in the in the book, and um, that has to do with how life experience carries more weight than the Bible does. And so let's welcome back the Bible study guys to illustrate this. Well, glad to see you all again. Well, today we're going to be discussing from the Bible, John chapter 14 and verse 12. You might want to follow along. It's Jesus talking here. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. I love this passage because we get to do the same miracles that Jesus did. Hold on now. It is very clear that this sort of thing was just for the first century. But he says... I know what he says, but I once prayed for my friend's little boy who was very sick, and not only did he not get better, he died. I'm sorry to hear that, but he says... And then there was the time I asked God for wisdom. I thought he said that I should give money to this organization and it turned out to be a scam. Maybe it was God's will for you to be taken in by that scam to teach you a lesson. What lesson? That I should not ask God for wisdom? You must be praying wrong because Matthew 21 verse 22 clearly says, Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. You obviously don't have faith. Whoa, 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 this is getting kind of personal. Can we get back to what the Bible says? Absolutely. I make sure that whatever I ask for is God's will first before I pray, as it says in 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Have you seen miracles? Well, it depends what you mean by miracles. I prefer to stick with general matters. I guess if you don't shoot at anything, you can't miss. 
I think we're going to have to dig into this a little more. Or perhaps we're going to have to pray about it first just to make sure it's God's will. So we're going to talk about the greater works that Jesus, Yeshua, speaks about in uh, the Gospel of John. We're going to do that in a little bit, but let's, let's address the problem. As I've been delving into this, I'm realizing it's actually not that different from the first undermining force, what does it mean to me, instead of what does it mean. It also deals with the one that's the second one in the book, how truth can't be known. Um, and it all has to do with how probably our greatest filter in, in, that's getting in the way of encountering truth which is how the Bible expresses what life is all about. The thing that, that gets in the way is us. And that's probably true for so many things in our lives that even when we realize it, when we know what's going on, we look through life through the filter of ourselves. We understand life based on how we understand life. Even when we're open to correction, we're open to being taught something, we come at that through ourselves. On one hand, we can't help it, but we do need to fight against it. So this issue of how life experience gets in the way of understanding how life really works, understanding truth, which is God's truth. And in case I need to say it, it's something that I say on a regular basis. The word for truth in the scriptures, the Greek, the Hebrew, the word for truth is the same as our understanding of the concept of reality. Reality is, a, is truth. It, it, both those words have to do with the way things really are. And the Bible reveals to us the way things really are. The problem is we come at even what the Bible says through the filter of our own life experience. So as we grow up, we see the world through the way we experience the world. And that is a filter of, of input as it comes to us. And so it's a challenge for us to get to what the Bible is actually saying because of this very, very strong lens we see the world through, which is ourselves. Now, the way experience can get in the way of truly understanding the scriptures can work in two ways. First, if I haven't experienced something, then I don't believe it. And the other is whatever I've experienced, then it's true. And we'll, we'll get to each of these. So the first one, if I haven't experienced it, then I don't believe it. Now, this isn't 100% the case because we could accept something to be true if we believe the source that the information is coming from is reliable. So if somebody could tell me what it's like to be on a beach in Hawaii. Now, I could look at pictures and all the rest, but when they explain to me what it looks like, the smells, for example, um, living in Vancouver for many years, especially Vancouver City proper, and haven't been there in a few years, but it has it has a scent, not a, not a smell, but a, it has a scent to it that in Ottawa, we don't have. And you have to, in a sense, you have to experience it to, to really believe it. Now, I've been to other places that have scents or smells in the environment. And in other, other places, well, Mon Montreal is very interesting of, of this. Where we lived, um, we were many kilometers or miles away from a distillery, the Seagram's Distillery. And depending on how the wind blew, every now and then there would be this pungent odor in our neighborhood. We go, oh, there's Seagram's. Um, didn't mean to make that as, a, as an ad in any way, but it's just an experience of living in that part of Montreal. Now, if where you live, if where you live, you've never experienced that sort of thing, you might find it strange. And even more strange, the general scent that I think has to do with the trees in Vancouver City. Being 
in a suburb such as Surrey, which is uh, south of Vancouver proper, you don't get that same scent as right in Vancouver itself. If you've never experienced anything like this, you might find it hard to believe. If you experience something like it, for example, if you've gone to a, a tropical country by the seaside, and then the, the sea brings a certain kind of scent to even the nearby town. If you've experienced something like it before, you might be able to believe that there's a different kind of scent in a different kind of place. If where you live doesn't have that kind of experience, I don't really notice that in Ottawa. Sometimes with certain weather I do, but generally speaking, it, there is no scent to the environment in which we live. And if this is all you've known, you might find it kind of strange. However, you might have trust in the person that you're speaking to, and you know they're very reliable. If they've experienced it and they're sharing the information, it might be you might be able to accept it. But by and large, when we haven't experienced something, we find it very difficult to believe. Now, with this idea of trusting in someone or a source, that should apply to how we relate to the Bible. And it is the way I try to relate to it. Now, People make a fuss over certain issues in the Bible that might undermine its reliability. Now, all these years, over 40 years that I've been studying the Bible, the more I study it, the more I can trust, I do trust in its reliability. And that's one of the things I, I try to share with people. Uh, you know, all of Scripture for all of life. If the Bible truly teaches something, now we might get something wrong, but if the Bible truly teaches something, I believe it's we can re rely on that. And that's what this is about. I'm trying to push through how our lack of experiences of some of the things that the Bible teaches gets in the way of what it's teaching. And as I share that, I'm speaking to myself. And for me, some of the, the big things like we, when that, the, with the Bible study guys, which I guess that's what I'm calling them now, with the Bible study guys, they were dealing with this thing of, of can we actually replicate or engage in or do the works, the miracles that Yeshua did? And we're going to get to that. And if we haven't, but if we haven't experienced that sort of thing, it's difficult to believe it. And then there's whole theological systems wrapped around what I believe might be people's experience. So, I can, engage, I can engage that subtopic, but for me, a difficult one is something such as resting in God's love, being secure in God's love. That's a big one. And because of my life experience, I'm being vulnerable now, because of my life experience, growing up in a very insecure home, experiencing a lot of rejection, a lot of confusion in relationships in my formative years, grasping that I have a Father in Heaven who's committed to being with me at all times, that's difficult for me because of my experience. But am I going to insist that my experience is going to get in the way of me understanding the truth of Scripture? My desire is to not let it do that. And I call it to God to help me to engage His Word despite where I'm coming from in my experience. I hope that makes sense. The other side of this, when it's they're very close together, is the whatever I experience, then it's true. And, and so this can relate to what I've just said. Because I have experienced insecurity, even as I have known the Lord, and if you know my story and you can look that up, how I was having panic attacks when I was almost 19 and I asked the Lord to come into my life and the panic attacks disappeared. I thought that's what was going to be forever. Then later, when I struggled again with levels of anxiety uh, and that sought to undermine what I thought happened to me when I asked the Lord into my life, again, I, this is all how experience is affecting me and is getting in the way of the objective truth of what the Bible actually says. So there's that kind of experience getting in the way. And the other way experience can get in the way, having experienced something, is perhaps 
Um, one had a good experience of life, of God, of Bible, and it was in a particular context, in a particular community, through a particular book, through a particular approach, uh, th this sort of thing. It's very difficult for us to then question elements of what happened to us because they were the source of great blessing or great change. A personal example, going back to when I came to know the Lord, is I was told that if I said this prayer, asking Yeshua into my life and asking God to forgive my sins, that I would be happy for the rest of my life. Now, there's all sorts of issues with that statement. Some of it, getting back to experience, is what does happy mean? Uh, did I actually understand what was being said to me? But I... Based, I, I had the impression, and then based on my experience, that when the panic attacks went away, I was going to have an emotional, particular emotional state all the time. And especially those first few months, I would have been tempted to uh, give that promise to other people that I was sharing this message with. And it's since then, I've, the whole thing is very complicated because there's a certain kind of happiness a blessedness that the Bible speaks about, that we are guaranteed, though we could lose contact with it, we can get detached from it, um, but there's a certain kind of happiness that we shouldn't promise to people, that as if we could have a la-di-da, happy, happy, carefree kind of life, uh, as if by saying this particular formula that all, you know, we're just going to be, you know, ha-ha-ha, carefree all the time, and that's that's not, Yeshua didn't promise that. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, you will overcome the world. It's, it's, a, it's a far more complex thing. It's complex experientially. It's complex emotionally. Um, but it's easy for us to, it would be easy for me to try to replicate everything that happened that day as if this came down from heaven, like the Ten Commandments coming from God on Mount Sinai, that my experience of God on that day is supposed to be the experience that everybody is supposed to have, and that's the kind of like a, going to be the cookie cutter approach that I'm going to take with everybody, and never be open to any kind of correction because it worked for me, and this it worked for me tends to then color my approach to how God's truth is supposed to work in everybody's life. And that's been a, uh, that's been a problem. It's, and that's one of the ways that denominations have been formed or splits and new groups have been formed because a particular experience happened and God was blessing a certain thing. And then we don't want to question anything that God might have blessed because that seems to undermine what God is doing. And there's an expression, we need to eat the meat and spit out the bones. No offense to vegetarians. Um, uh, eat the eat the inside, spit out the peel. I guess that's not exactly how you do it. Whatever it is, we need to be people of discernment. And the way life happens to us, even the way the good things of life happens to us, experiences in God happen to us, we don't experience these things in an absolutely pure, 100%, everything is absolutely from God sort of way. We're people of, of assumption and of of. We don't get things perfectly right and things don't happen to us in this pure sort of way. So we need to be open to let the Bible teach us what really is. So, you know, maybe you've never had a subjective experience of God. Maybe your emotions have never been touched Maybe you've never had something really unusual happen to you. And then it does. And then it's very easy to take that experience and think, well, that's how it's all supposed to work. Life is more complicated than that. Scripture is more complicated than that. We're more complicated than that. And so we have to be careful not to allow a blessing of God justify things that actually aren't true. Uh, and so it's this whole thing of we need to be willing to, when we eat the meat, to spit out the bones. And how do we know how to do this kind of discernment? Well, that is from the scriptures. And, and so it's, I want to point out an example of how God used life experience 
to teach a lesson about his word. And that's Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Moses is recounting the experience of Israel through the wilderness the past 40 years. And he says, he says about God, and he humbled you and let you hunger and feed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know <laughs> that sorry for being I'm not going to apologize for Moses for being repetitive that he might make you know that God does not live by bread alone but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord so this is an example about how God designed an experience that he took the people of Israel through to open them up to what truth really is what the scripture actually teaches and in this case he created a situation where they would not have food that they would be hungry then moses would ask god what to do moses would direct the people and and so direct them to eat this mysterious substance that would appear every day in the wilderness which they called manna and all this was designed by God to teach them a particular lesson that that people don't are not people are not to live on bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord and this is one of the things I, I, I love explaining uh, and because some people think this not living by bread alone but by every word that comes from God is we don't only live by bread this is what people think we don't only live by bread also by God's word but that's not what God is saying through Moses here God is seeking to was seeking to teach people of Israel and us a way to live life and there's two approaches to life that are being described here there's the bread alone living and then there is the through every word that comes from the mouth of God living Either we're going to live based on our desires, by our experiences, by through ourselves, or we're going to be living life through what God says to us. This is what the people of Israel needed to learn. This is what we still need to learn. Either our lives are going to be derived from the place of our desires, like through our gut, so to speak, or we're going to be in a posture where we're waiting upon God, we're relying upon God, where we're hearing His Word and living accordingly. And so the life experience of the people of Israel going hungry was designed to teach them not to rely on life experience, but to rely on God. This is how it's supposed to work. And so let's go to the reference in in John chapter 14, verse 12, where the Lord tells his disciples, and I believe we have every reason to believe that what he told them applies to us as well, that because we trust in him, greater works will we do. Now, I will contend that our those of us who don't believe that we will do greater works than him comes from us not experiencing it of course you could argue with me and maybe you've experienced miracles of different kinds unusual events and still don't believe actually that this should be part of our lives in some sort of normal way some sort of normal way so we can't get into to it all that much in the in this podcast But I do want to encourage you to think upon what the Lord is saying here and just a whole approach to life that is reflected in his word. And don't let, let's not let our life experience and the lack of seeing God's power working in and through our lives get in the way of an expectation that he actually wants to do that. Now, so I'm aware that one of the ways certain people, my words, cope with our not experiencing miracles, signs and wonders is really the the biblical way to to, to think about it. 
Um, the way we cope with that is we think in terms of the greater works as being greater in scope. So we had Yeshua as one person in one place in a particular time period doing amazing things. And the gospel, as it grew through the centuries, has done all sorts of amazing good in the world. And some people may not understand that or agree with that, but the world has been impacted powerfully by the goodness of the Word of God, by the preaching of the good news through the centuries. And there is a sense that that is far greater than whatever happened in the land of Israel in the first century with Yeshua and his small group of followers, actually a larger group of followers, but mainly through the, the apostles, the special sent ones. I don't know if, it, if that, I don't think that holds water. It's true in its own sense, but is that really what Yeshua was talking about when he talked about that we would do the greater works? Okay, let's, let's jump to the people that say, yes, of course, he said he would do the greater works, so we should be doing signs and wonders. Yes, yes. There's a corrective that's that's required here. Now, it's interesting. In, in Mark 11, 23 and elsewhere, Yeshua says, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Well, between the promise of greater works in John chapter 14 and this this directive by the Lord saying that if if we say, if only we have faith, and don't doubt, we should be able to say to um, the mountain, be thrown to the sea, and it's going to be done. I could see why we might assume that we should be able to do this at will. Almost as if doing the greater works is like a superpower that's been given to Yeshua's followers. As if we can kind of like zap things through our fingers. And, and the only reason why we can't zap things Kabow. The only reason why we can't do that is because we don't have enough faith. But you don't have to read too much of the Bible, the New Testament, to see that can't be what he's talking about. Because we don't see the disciples just zapping problems away everywhere they go. It's not like that. Yes, there are amazing signs and wonders that are done at the hand of the word of Yeshua's followers. But there isn't a sense that that it's as if we've been given, uh, you know, magical powers that anything we turn turns to miracles. It's not like that. There's something else going on. And the key is faith. The key has to do with this all-important biblical concept of faith. Now, the concept of faith deserves a greater treatment that I'm going to be able to give to it in our time here. But let me just say that the biblical concept of faith has to do with reliance upon God. Faith is reliance upon God. It's, it's more that than thinking things about God, about life. We often think of faith as, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, no, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. But if we're honest, we, we wonder, we struggle. Oh, there it is. I'm admitting uh, that I, I struggle with this. And I struggle. I mentioned earlier that I still struggle with a sense of security, even though God says in his word that I'm secure in him. I still struggle with, well, no wonder. No wonder I'm not experiencing God the way they should. It's all my fault because I'm not really trusting in him and all this sort of thing. There's a wonderful story. I don't have the reference in front of me where the where the where this dad comes before the Lord and, and he says, if you are willing uh, you can heal my son. And the Lord says, if I am willing, anything's possible to him who believes. And he says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Well, that's quite the thing to say. And then his son gets healed. What's that about? Help me with my unbelief. Well, I guess the Lord helped him with unbelief. And now he believed, fully believed, and zappo, his son was, was, was healed. There's something so much more to this. And I believe it all, I believe, I believe it all has to do with true faith, which is a reliance upon God. There's this fundamental relational component that we're often missing. And we will discover 
God's reality, His truth, His power, not as we rely upon ourselves, our experiences, other people's experiences, you know, trusting in what other people have experienced. There's that the story in Acts where these people are going around and they're trying to cast out demons according to the name of the, the Yeshua that Paul, they probably said Jesus, the Jesus in Greek that Paul was preaching. And it's just a, a wonderful, uh, interesting picture of trying to replicate the experience of somebody else rather than living out an experience of what we have. There is an experience available to us in a relationship with the Almighty God through the Messiah. And it's as we rely on Him and rely on His Word, as we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And that's why the the fathers of Yeshua didn't go around just zapping people well, left, right, and center. They actually did exactly what, what the Messiah did, doing what the Father was doing, speaking what the Father was saying, keeping as, as the Lord, as his followers, kept their eye on what God was actually doing, and relying on his word, relying on his leading, that was the key. That was the key of experiencing the things that God wanted them to experience. And it's the same key given to us today. It's not a magic formula. It's just a core truth that we could know the wonders of God, the greater works, the whatevers that God wants us to experience if we, instead of relying on ourselves and our experiences, rely on what he's saying in his word and how he's speaking to us by his spirit, if we would do that, we would know him as we have been called to know him. We will experience him as we have been designed to experience him if we would have faith, which is reliance upon him. What do you think? I'm trying to express it the best I can. You have anything to add? You don't agree with me? You have any questions? You can reach out to me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Don't forget, if you're in the Ottawa area, register for God's Epic Story Seminar that I'll be doing on June the 10th. Send me your questions. Don't forget to subscribe, to review, to like, and to share. Really appreciate it. It really helps. Until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Music